Welcome back, my dear students. If you want to learn something new about the reality in which we all exist and you are not afraid of science, you came to the right place. As always, I will deal here with the most hardcore form of physics, practical science of the micro and the macro scale, combined into a single mechanism of our amazing and expanding universe. Beginning from subatomic particles, through planets and stars, up until colossal clusters of galaxies, everything is about interactions of electromagnetic fields. Everything what actually differs quantum mechanics and astrophysics is the scale, as each frame of reference depends mostly on the physical size, but at the very bottom of whole physical existence you can find the simple and universal truth. Reality is just the same as above, so below. Of course, according to official science, Atoms and celestial bodies exist in completely different realities. Newtonian mechanics can be applied to quantum physics as subatomic particles don't behave like solid bodies. But electromagnetism is a completely different story. Magnetic fields and electric currents are just the same, no matter if we speak about the solar system or about an atom. In my previous movie I promised you to speak a bit more about the magnetic fields in space. So maybe we should begin from the micro scale to explain what is the source of magnetic force. Each kind of physical matter has some magnetic properties, which are defined by the configuration of atoms. However, all magnetic fields begin at the subatomic level. As I said last time, there is still a lot of confusion when it comes to explain magnetism using our current knowledge of this subject. However, it is a well-known fact that all subatomic particles have an intrinsic property known as magnetic moment which allows them to act like tiny magnets. Magnetic moment of a particle is determined by the orientation of its quantum spin, which has only two possible values, up and down. But of course we shouldn't think about them as about actual directions in 3D space. According to official explanation, quantum spin is defined by the direction in which a particle rotates around its own axis similar to planets in the solar system. However, such analogy is rather incorrect, as we simply can't use standard mechanics of solid bodies in quantum physics. Comparing subatomic particles to planets can lead us to completely incorrect conclusions. To understand quantum mechanics, we need to stop thinking about subatomic particles as about tiny bits of solid matter. Anyway, in the difference to magnets in macro scale, magnetic moments of two electrons will be cancelled out if they have opposite spin directions and are placed on the same orbital. Paramagnetic property of an atom is created by unpaired electrons. Atom will gain strong ferromagnetic properties if there will be many unpaired electrons on the outer orbitals and they will have the same orientation of spin, just like in the case of iron. Direction of quantum spin in those unpaired electrons define the magnetic orientation of the entire atom. However, a single atom still can't be considered a permanent magnet. To create a measurable magnetic field in the macro scale, we need some number of atoms in a ferromagnetic material which will be aligned by their magnetic orientations. When it will happen, a group of atoms will create a structure called a magnetic domain. The smallest permanent magnet was created from only five atoms. To align the orientation of atoms in ferromagnetic and paramagnetic materials, we need to expose them to an external magnetic field or allow an electric current to flow through them. Both methods will alter the orientation of atoms in a single direction, what will finally create a full-scale magnetic field in the surrounding space. Images on the left side show nicely how it works. In shortcut, magnetic field is created when in a group of particles magnetic orientation is aligned. The same principle can be applied to particles which create an electric current. Entire electromagnetism is based on three vectors, which are always perpendicular to each other. It's the velocity combined with electric and magnetic components of a particle. Direction of the current defines the electric component of particles in a stream, while orientation of their quantum spin is responsible for the magnetic field. Magnetic and motion vectors have to be perpendicular to the electric component. In a current, direction of electric vector is already defined, what limits the possible orientations of motion and the quantum spin to a 2D plane, 
which is perpendicular to the electric component. Quantum spin of particles which are moving in a stream is aligned perpendicularly to the current direction. And as I said earlier, alignment of spin creates a magnetic field which in this case is oriented spirally around the conductor. The same rule can be as well applied to the motion vector of particles, what forces them to move helically within the current. And this is generally everything what you need to know about electromagnetism to understand my model. I think that it would be enough for the quantum reality. So let's move now to the macro scale. As you probably know, most of celestial bodies in the solar system have their own magnetic fields. Official science explained the process which creates them using so-called dynamo theory. But I won't go further into its details as this subject is at this time just a speculation. What matters is to know that just like in the case of atoms which create magnetic domains in permanent magnets, magnetic fields of the planets in solar system are more or less aligned with the magnetic orientation of the sun, making the heliosphere. I can as well make exactly the same statement about galactic magnetic fields which align the magnetic orientations of all star systems which are placed within this field. Images above show how strong are the similarities between heliosphere and a galactic field. Actually, it's even hard to guess which image represents the galaxy and which one the Sun. Generally, galactic magnetic fields still remain a mystery for the science. Even if standard model try to explain the shape of galaxies using the force of gravity, it is pretty clear that the spiral arms are in fact formed along magnetic field lines. To show how big are the holes in our current knowledge of this subject, I will mention that just a year ago, scientists announced the discovery of a magnetic bridge which connects two galaxies, even if such connections are something pretty obvious. But let's go back to Earth and its magnetic field. I know that for many of new followers, my recent movies were rather too difficult to comprehend. That's why I will now explain the basics of my model. Let's begin from discussing the structure of magnetosphere. Just like every other magnetic field, magnetosphere is made of two kinds of field lines. Open field lines are connected to Earth on one side, while on the second side they are connected to interplanetary magnetic field, IMF. Those field lines are responsible for the exchange of energy between Earth and the space environment and create the shape of magnetosphere. Closed field lines are connected on both sides to Earth and create the inner magnetosphere which contains the layer known as plasmosphere as well as ionosphere and atmosphere. They are responsible for keeping the energy trapped in the environment of Earth. During the process known as magnetic reconnection, closed magnetospheric field lines can break apart and connect to IMF just as two open field lines can connect with each other and become a closed single one. This process causes a rapid flow of energy and creates geomagnetic disturbances, what is the source of auroras over our magnetic poles. According to the well-known rules of electromagnetism, energetic particles are spiraling along magnetic field lines, creating structures known as flux tubes. In the case of closed field lines, those tubes are suspended high above the surface, and the energy is being trapped within the inner magnetosphere. Much more interesting are the open magnetospheric field lines, which allow an active transfer of particles between the Earth and IMF. In my model, this process is responsible for the circulation of air masses in the atmosphere and creates the polar vortex above the magnetic poles. Generally, in the areas where open magnetospheric field lines stick out from the Earth's surface, we can expect to see increased atmospheric vorticity as in those regions there is an active exchange of energy between the planet and the space environment. Here is a nice example. According to my model, open magnetospheric field line is located right in the center of this spinning air mass, which is driven by the transfer of energy between space and the atmosphere. However, the energy can flow in both directions, depending on the space weather conditions. Sometimes particles are transferred from space into the atmosphere and sometimes particles from atmosphere can be sucked out into space. This particular flux tube has negative orientation, as the outflow of energy is visibly stronger than the inflow. However, all flux tubes are created by two opposite currents. 
This is why we can see a small dose of energy being transferred into the atmosphere. What defines the orientation of this process, which is known as flux transfer event, FTE, is the balance between the income and outcome of particles. Negative currents are directed outwards from Earth and act like a vacuum cleaner, which sucks out the energy from atmosphere and transfers it into space in the form of plasma bubbles, plasmoids. This is why FTEs with negative orientation are associated with low atmospheric pressure, and in the area of flux tube connection we can expect to see a low pressure system. And now let's look at the behavior of air masses which are being affected by a FTE with positive current orientation. An electromagnetic connection which transfers energy from the solar wind towards the Earth's surface along an open magnetospheric field line. I think that it's quite easy to notice the difference. But now things are getting slightly more complicated. In my previous movie I was explaining that the surface level is separated from space by the ionosphere which prevents the inflow of solar particles into the neutral part of atmosphere. If Earth wouldn't be protected by the ionosphere, we would be exposed directly to a deadly ionizing radiation. However, even if ionosphere cuts out all plasma currents, interaction between both environments is still possible due to the influence of static fields. In shortcut, energetic particles from the solar wind which are trying to enter the atmosphere are being stopped by the ionosphere and gather around the open magnetospheric field line hundreds of kilometers above the surface. This causes the increase of electric charge in this area and affects the air masses in lower atmosphere, which are being attracted by the growing electric potential. Particles which are separated by the layer of ionosphere are trying to reach each other creating pressure on both sides. This causes very often some rapid disturbances in the ionosphere. If the pressure becomes strong enough to allow opposite potentials getting close to each other and cause a discharge of energy. But in the difference to everything what I said until now, it is rather just my guess than officially approved knowledge. As you can see on the meteorological charts, in the area of positively oriented flux tube connection, surface pressure is rather high, 1015 hectopascals. Besides, instead to suck out the equatorial air masses, this system is dragging cold and dry polar air to lower latitudes. Although there is a lot of missing data from this period of time, 11 to 13 December 2017, around the time when this atmospheric anomaly appeared over northwestern Africa, on SWMF plus RCM magnetosphere simulation, we can clearly see that there was an inflow of particles from the magnetotail into the plasmasphere. What could be the cause of positively oriented FTEs in the atmosphere? And here we can see the opposite process. Outlaw of plasma which is responsible for negatively oriented FTEs in the atmosphere.